Um, and that's the end of the presentations. We now have a panel discussion, which will be facilitated by Helmut. Thank you very much, Jock. I'm looking forward now to this um, uh, next round here. The final part of our uh, session this morning will be a moderated panel discussion. We have had very rich, very informative presentations. I would now like to ask all the speakers to join me here at the podium in whatever order you would like to sit. That doesn't really matter. I think there should be enough chairs for everybody. So please take a seat. Um, dear, dear colleagues, we have now um, a bit more than half an hour to take it a few steps for, uh, further, to, to synthesize uh, what we have heard, uh, to go a little uh, deeper into some more details, and I'm very much looking forward to that. This session is about um, possibilities, exploring on how to advance environmental risk assessment. We are already doing uh, a good job in different areas on environmental risk assessments. We are specifically focusing today on GMOs, but the point is, how can, we, how can we do better? How can we take these important <coughs> next steps? How can we take it further? And how can we improve our approaches? And I would just like to throw out uh, a couple of uh, may maybe guiding questions for our uh, panel discussion uh, this morning, um, which could be um, uh, thought-provoking to you to, to come in and to present your views on that. Well, first of all, um, on the issue of making protection goals operational, I would be interested, having heard uh, the presentations this morning, what you think. Is the concept of um, ecosystem services, um, is it an appropriate concept to be uh, implemented in making protection goals operational? What are the pros and cons of that? And what does it mean for environmental risk assessment in practice in the GMO area? That would be my first question. Then. On the issue of um, reliability and relevance of um, studies, uh, data, uh, supporting environmental risk assessment. Um, what about this problem formulation? Do you think that problem formulation, as it has been presented today, um, um, is an appropriate mechanism to achieve what I think is the goal to achieve, to distinguish between ecological uh, risk research and environmental risk assessment. How to implement problem formulation in practice in order to um, achieve that we are asking the right questions, that we are doing the right studies, uh, that we are, in order to use words m m uh, used today by our presenters, are looking for the need to know issues and uh, are keeping aside the nice to know issues, but striking a good balance so that we, from an ecological perspective, don't forget about important issues. And what do you think about these um, studies presented today on the non-target organisms by Jörg? Are this, is, is this a good example on how to, how to move forward? And then finally, of course, this uh, major challenge on integrated uh, environmental risk assessment. How to, um, how to take into account multiple stressors? Uh, how can we manage to um, meet this challenge? Do you have practical suggestions on how to do uh, what I think is the goal here. Again, how to achieve a good balance. Uh, and what do you think about the B example presented to us today? Is it a, an appropriate example on which we could learn also for the GMO risk assessment area? So I know a couple of questions now, but I would like to take them all together. I would leave it up to you uh, to which one of those questions you would like to respond. Um, please, the floor is for a first round uh, yours in the audience. I would like to collect maybe two or three questions and then see uh, who from the podium would like to, to answer. If you have an, a specific question to a specific uh, colleague sitting on the podium, then please say so. I'm also looking to maybe uh, take colleagues who have not yet uh, been able to speak. Gentlemen over there. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Peter Dohmen, the as of Germany. My question would be to the first part of uh, the presentation that is on, on uh, ecosystem services and biodiversity. Um, and then to your part, how does this relate to what we do to regulate it, to regulate pesticides, etc.? My question is, would be, are we jumping a bit short if we only look at one part of the ecosystem? 
For example, <clears throat> just to elaborate this a little bit, um, an ecosystem is usually embedded in a landscape. Yeah? So you have in a landscape an area with very fertile soils, then you have areas with slopes, with sandy soils and wetlands and whatsoever. Wouldn't it be advantage and a large advantage for biodiversity as well if we let this fertile part of the area being managed and also um, that we accept some effect on this fertile part and take away the other parts out of production and increase biodiversity. What we do at the moment is we pay farmers to uh, drain wetlands, we pay them to fertilize sandy slopes and then we punish them if they use uh, all their tools on the fertile area. Yeah? So for the whole system, for the ecosystem, for the biodiversity as such, I think we should look a bit further than just on this one tool of uh, pesticide management in fertile soils. Okay, thank you. A question which relates a bit to general agricultural policy uh, questions. Uh, I take two more and then we look at the podium. Uh, please, over there and then okay. another person um, over there. Please. <coughs> Joachim Schiemann, Julius Kühn Institute, uh, Germany. Uh, at first, I would like to thank the organizers of this session. Uh, this session really made my week here and I know now why I spent uh, time and uh, taxpayers' money to come here. Um, I would have a question to, to Ellen. Um, so you were speaking about paradigm changes uh, we might need uh, in relation uh, to the question uh, is uh, risk assessment and risk management, including regulation, uh, linked to uh, the technology, science-based, or should we not move into the direction to link risk assessment, risk management, including regulation, uh, to the new trade and uh, the new product? So just to, let's say, to make the discussion broader, not being only fixed uh, to GMO, but uh, to any kind of new traits in agriculture. Um, having said that, uh, of course, we have to take care uh, that we will not put the burden uh, on the new traits, uh, the same burden as we are putting on GM traits. So are there triggers um, for decision which of these uh, new trades products might be risk assessed and regulated and which not. Okay, <clears throat> thank you Joachim and also thank you for your compliments uh, to this session which we of course um, are very glad to hear. So there was one further question on this side of the room, if I, yeah, uh, Nick and, or you have not been able to speak yet so I, I give the floor to you and uh, Nick, Detlef and uh, your, uh, the other colleague is coming in the next uh, round, Eva please. Okay. So. Uh, Eva Bobulska from Poland. I have a question to the last speaker. What's your personal view on European Commission restriction in use of neonics for two years period, if I can ask? <laughs> okay, thank you so far for the question. I hand over to the podium. Let's start with the last question first, if you, if you, if you don't mind. Okay, please. So you want to my, know my personal opinion on the EU suspension of neonics. Um, it's difficult because I'm always looked at as, as, a, as a representing USDA. What, I, what I'm a little disappointed in is that there wasn't more funding put behind testing whether to see the ban was having an effect. When I talk to different people, I'm not seeing pre, post, and whatever studies. So that, I think we're, there's a missed opportunity. How's that? Okay, thank you very much. There were two more points, one on these more agricultural policy relevant issues, uh, uh, ecosystem services, pesticides, and the other one on process-based versus product-based, the trade approach. Ellen was uh, addressed uh, uh, directly. Maybe you would like to give it a start, and then we hand over to others who would like to come in. Ellen, okay. please. Um, I'd like to say something about the ecosystem services point, which is in, in trying to make these broad and rather vague uh, policy protection goals, it, operational, translate them into something. I mean, ecosystem services is a, is a pretty good way of doing it, but it's not all-encompassing. It's not biodiversity. And I, I, I know 
you know, the, speak, <laughs> the speaker here on my left is going to agree with me on that. that there's, we know there's a good deal of redundancy in a lot of ecosystems, so that much of the functionality, like decomposition and pollination and so on, would be carried out with fewer species, with less richness. This is why I was trying to say in my talk that concepts like biodiversity are extremely complex to ecologists. That, you know, they're to do with richness, with evenness, with the, with the different sorts of habitats within a landscape scale. You have, to, you have to be very careful in defining biodiversity. It's used as a catch-all. But if you don't have the wherewithal to measure everything, the fact that it has a functionality, that it's providing some sort of service, I think is a jolly good first go at it. And, and although it doesn't actually measure all the biodiversity, it tells us whether the system is functioning. And if you include the sorts of things which Lorraine included, like um, the way it makes people feel, the cultural, the sense of inheritance, I want my grandchildren to be able to hear skylarks and to see the butterflies that I saw when I was a child. If you add those things in, then I think it gives you a, a dimension to measure it. But I, you know, it, it's a poor substitute in a way because we don't quite know how to measure biodiversity in relation to risk assessment, I think. Um, I, I, perhaps if I can answer Joachim's Please. question very briefly, um, I, I, I'm going to toss it back to people like Jan who, and, and the Acre Committee, which I helped look at this, who said it doesn't really make sense to regulate these crops just because of the way they were produced. Um, why don't we do what the Canadians do and say, look, this is going to have an impact on agriculture, however it's been produced. If it's herbicide tolerant, they're going to be using a herbicide. You know, why are we making a special case here? Why don't we fit GM risk assessment in with the, with the totem of our agricultural changes in, in the landscape in Europe? Because they, they could well be used, as well as conventional ones, could well need looking at much more carefully than they are. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on the podium who would like to come in? Joe? Uh, yeah, just to add a, a, a comment to Alan's uh, um, comments here on, on plants with novel traits or, or uh, regulating on the basis of process. Um, I guess uh, when I was a regulator, I used to, when these questions would come up, I could hide behind the thing, uh, I don't do policy, I just do what the legislation says I can do. And I guess the reason I say that is, is because um, uh, uh, what what we regulate as, as regulators is determined by by politicians, and politicians make those decisions on the basis of what community values are, con are conveyed to them. I guess if I've got a, a, a personal preference, I actually um, the Australian system, as Alan mentioned, is is based on process. It's based on on genetic modification. But if I had a personal preference, I'd probably lean more towards the the, the, the trait rather than the process. But I do, I do understand that uh, when the Australian system was being developed, or so I've heard, was that um, there was consideration given to different models. And one of the, one of the things against going on a trait basis would, is that it would have meant that there would have been regulatory capture then of things that hadn't previously been regulated, like triazine tolerant canola, for example, which isn't, which isn't GM. So it was that. But uh, so I guess I, I lean towards. Uh, regulating on the basis of the product rather than the process, but yeah. um, I guess ultimately that's determined by our, uh, by our respective governments. Okay, thank you. Um, and that shows that probably this issue would need some more discussion because it's probably not um, black and white. Is it only process-based or only product-based? Maybe it's uh, um, an approach which encompasses both, primarily looks at the product, but also takes into account process issues, which may be the way forward in this, in, in this area. It's currently debated in very different fora, and I, I think that's very important and that's very appropriate. And of course, the balance should be um, well taken um, to see what, that, what implications that has for regulation of other products. So um, let's go for a second round to the auditorium. And here I will now take those who have uh, asked uh, before, starting with Detlef, then colleague over there, then Nick, and then uh, a few more. Detlef, please. I can give you my <laughs> mic. Okay, thank you, um, Helmut. So again, Detlef Bartsch. Um, 
from my background, I had taken all the transition from a uh, member of an NGO fighting against gene technology, then coming to science, doing the field testing, now being uh, a regulator within, and also some years within EFSA and the GMO panel. And what um, drives me uh, at, in, at every stage is how can we make the, the data, the studies more reliable? And I think it was maybe common ground for, for all the, sp the speakers uh, this, uh, this morning. Um, Concerning ecosystem services, I, I feel that we sh this could be the bridge to the, the public to as, as a communication uh, experiment because we, we can't test all. Right? That, that was also mentioned by, by several of you. And if we at least test species that belong to the important groups, that, that's uh, maybe also good for communication to the public. The other thing is, uh, it was mentioned only brief briefly, but I think you have, haven't had time maybe to, to spend uh, more words on the uh, on this existing methodology, the OECD guidelines, uh, where people really spend a lot of time to make these tests reliable. Uh, we are entering, of course, new grounds. We have new organisms, new chemicals, and not always new, uh, uh, not always old methodologies can be used. And, um, how can we uh, go forward to to use the old guidance, but taking into account uh, new developments? So, for example, the, the latest technologies of CRISPR-Cas, which is a revolution in, 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 in another step in, in biology. Okay, thank you, Detlef. Good question and interesting career, by the way. Uh, can we hand over the microphone to a colleague sitting behind you? Hey, Martin from Pan-Europe. Um, thanks again to all for your interesting uh, presentations. Um, the objectives, it was mentioned the, this morning of the European Commission is to stop biodiversity erosion by 2020. The, the first objective was to stop it by 2010, it was missed. Now there is a midterm report saying that it's surely going to miss, be missed again. Um, so my question, and, and this is related to Jeff's presentation, um, your presentation and your study shows that it's very, of course you cannot test everything in the pre-approval um, period and your, your study shows that, um, um, that also that combination of factors or, or some synergies can, can have a negative effect on bees. Uh, and, and I would like to know how, how can risk assessors um, deal with this in the post-approval process according to you because um, I think that uh, for the moment, uh, risk assessors really move on this when there is a pressure from the, the public and then the risk, for instance, the Commission asks EFSA to us to act on this. So how, how do you think risk assessors could be more proactive on, on, on this kind of issue and eventually design studies themselves and so on? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Nick Birch, over here. Thank you. This is a general question to everybody, I guess, on the panel and probably on the floor. But um, we've heard today a lot about um, agroecosystems, ecosystem services. Probably everyone agrees that's a good approach, although the limitations, like we've heard. My question is about trade-offs, really, between convenience and realism. Because if you're really interested in the agroecosystem, you need to do big-scale studies, and we can look at one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, but. Anyone that's done a jigsaw puzzle knows if you get a piece of blue sky, where the hell does it fit? So my question is, you know, how do we put the jigsaw puzzle together with all these little bits, and what can we feasibly do to get the big picture jigsaw puzzle? Thank you. I, I take one further question uh, at this side of uh, the room. The gentleman at the back. No, please, you, no. you come in the next round. Gentleman at the back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Vinicius from Brazil. Uh, my first question is a bit related to uh, Dr. York talk about the effect of Bt toxins in non-target organisms. So I work with uh, GM crops in the um, field of epigenetic regulations of gene expression, DNA methylation, and microRNAs, and also with omics techniques, proteomics, and transcriptomics. So I'd like I would like to ask not only Dr. York but the others. Uh, if they think that these kind of techniques that do not focus on the Bt toxin itself, but in the overall plant and expression, if they should be taken in account on risk assessment or not. And the second one is 
related to the first question here from the front. Um, I would like to know if uh, these crops being developed by zinc fingers and CRISPR-Cas uh, techniques, if they should undergo the same regulation and risk assessment of uh, GM crops, since there are some different opinions whether they are GM crops or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I would hand it again to the podium. A couple of very interesting questions. On the one hand, new techniques, how to um, take those into account in the risk assessment of, on the basis of the experience we have uh, from the OECD. On the other hand, can we also use new techniques uh, for, uh, for um, uh, doing risk assessments? Then a specific question again on the B topic. Um, and the overall issue of ecosystem services, where does it, where does it lead to? Uh, prob who would like to start? Maybe we take the B issue later, or you can answer it very briefly first, and then we hand over to the other things. Please. I think yeah. I can answer it briefly. Um, the regulatory agencies can only ask a chemical company to do one product, and the way we've dealt with it historically has been with incident reporting. Once something's out there, then it's used in different combinations commonly by the farmers in a certain way. If we see adverse effects, then they're reported, and then they're further tested. So that's... That's the way. I don't know of a proactive way in particular that's not onerous. It falls to university and government to do some of that testing um, of the combinations. Thank you. Jörg, you were uh, specifically addressed with the uh, NTO studies. Yeah, I, I uh, just want to share one thought. So I'm, I'm an entomologist, unfortunately, not a plant breeder, but I work with plant breeders. And what they are telling me is that, I mean, plant breeding, for example, has been remarkably safe over the thousands of years that we do it. Why? Because we, we select, we grow crops and things that look funny or strange or different that don't look like a maize plant, they are sorted out. And just by this very try and see uh, system, we have avoided major problems. And things like with potatoes, where we occasionally see problems and we know that there are problems with toxicants, alkaloids, we test for them specifically. And if I would just use the same logic for GM crops for the new breeding techniques, I think or I've asked myself, wouldn't we be as safe? Because even also a GM crop, you know, has gone through through many years of field selection. Through a, a, after an event approval, it has to go through a, in in Europe at least through a, a varietal approval process. So every maize that looks not like a maize plant or has any things strange things to it would be sorted out or would be looked at. And I think this is for me that would be the most logical approach. And, and to answer t to, to your uh, questions related omics, I think omics at that point, as far as I understand, they just help you to be even more sensitive and finding even the most, uh, the smallest possible difference. And nobody knows what that difference means. I have seen lots of omics presentations, but and people see all kinds of things, but they could never tell me what that means. And that's why I think we don't miss anything if we work with the plants, because we, you know, we have this experience and we are losing that in, in these discussions and are more busy to look even at smaller differences be because the differences that we see do not have an effect. And that's my worry. Okay. Uh, maybe, Lorraine, you would like to come in on the ecosystem service uh, point. Yeah, so I'm going to take us upscale from omics to <laughs> landscapes. Yes, um, that's good, that's good. And, and really come back to the point that Peter made in the first round of questions that I don't think we, we, we tattled, which I guess is also link, potentially linked into the question about the jigsaws and the blue skies. And I think you're right. I think we do need to increase scale. We do need to think at, land, at landscape scale, and we need to think about what we want our landscapes to be like. We focus very much on regulated products applied in a particular crop in a particular field, at a particular place. That's important, that's what we need to do. But if we're really interested in enhancing and protecting biodiversity at landscape scale, we need biodiversity of habitat. And we need to think about how that habitat is patterned. No use just having a little patch here and a little patch there if there's no way for the organisms to move between them. So we need to manage landscapes and watersheds and that, my, I would contend that we don't do that through the registration of individual products, but we do that by asking, well, that's a, I, I'll tell you a story about that. When I first heard that phone ring call, I was in a carriage, a railway carriage. It was a quiet carriage. 
And I thought, oh, someone whistling. And then it kept going off, and I thought, oh, well, maybe someone's got Tourette's, you know, because they make this noise. And then I was on another train a few days later, and I heard it again. I thought, oh, no, I'm being stalked by someone with Tourette's. And then it was a ring, mobile phone ring, so I, I feel fine now. But, but that was aside. But going back to the landscape, we need to decide what we want our landscapes to be like, and we need to manage them accordingly. And we do have incentives for that. A lot of our land is owned by private people, but we may want to manage it for public good, and therefore we need to incentivize, incentivize people to do that, and the cap can do it. But when we think about Europe, it's a highly managed landscape. How much pristine habitat do we really have? Whether we're managing it for nature, or we're managing it for agriculture, or we're managing it for somewhere for us to live, we're managing it. So we just need to accept that fact and say, what do we want it to look like? How do we want it patterned? And what incentives do we put in place to get the type of habitat we really do want? Okay, thank you. Uh, Glenn, maybe you would also like to come in on that topic, and then I would like to spend the, the last remaining minutes by turning again once more to the, um, to the audience. Glenn, yeah. please. Um, to continue on that point, uh, we, we have a little different culture in the United States, uh, very much more uh, libertarian and, and particularly uh, focused on property rights. Uh, so if the US EPA ever suggested that we were going to manage landscapes, there would be uh, mobs with torches and pitchforks at the gate. Um, but I, I think the, the uh, way I would suggest that, that we might start looking at, at the big picture and uh, where the, the, the blue sky piece fits in is by doing a, a better job of uh, environmental monitoring uh, at uh, the large scale and consistently. Um, we, I think, do a, a pretty good job of that with respect to uh, water in the United States because uh, we, we have a provision in the Clean Water Act that requires that the states uh, declare for every one of their uh, water bodies, uh, whether it's uh, biologically uh, or uh, chemically or physically impaired or not. And so we, we have you know, uh, programs and, and techniques uh, to deal with that. But uh, we don't look at, at the terrestrial environment um, nearly to the, the same degree. Uh, and you, you can see the difference. You know, for example, I, I, I mentioned in my talk that, that we're, we've learned that aquatic insects are, are more sensitive uh, than we realized uh, when, when we started doing our, our uh, standard toxicity test suite. Uh, and so we're now looking to uh, address that gap. And uh, so the, there's, there can be a direct feedback between what we see in the real world if, if we do the monitoring and interpretation of the monitoring and then what we subsequently do in a regulatory way. Okay, thank you very much. I would now like to spend the last couple of minutes, the remaining ones, by seeing if there are two, maximum three more questions from the auditorium and then we give back to the podium for final answers. One, two, three, and then I close the list. Starting with the gentleman over there who was patiently waiting, please. Uh, Ciro Gardi from uh, EFSA Plant Health. I have a couple of questions. I think the ecosystem services approach is definitely good and right. I was wondering if uh, also including a concept of uh, resistant, resistance and uh, resilience of ecosystem that are associated to biodiversity would be valuable as well. Professor Gray already outlined the importance and the complexity to deal with uh, biodiversity, but I think this uh, should be also taken into account. And then I have a question for uh, Professor York. Uh, in, in your speech, you uh, at the beginning, you outlined the fact that uh, you look at the above ground and below ground biodiversity, and you say that below ground is definitely more complex and more rich. I was wondering if you, in the battery of key organisms that you are using, you think you have uh, enough organisms for representing the complexity of the soil food web. Thank you. Further question on this part of the room? Yeah, the gentleman over there. Jose Tarazona, EFSA Pesticide Unit. I have a question uh, to the panel regarding how to address variability in the environment and the ecosystem. 
you have mentioned in your talks uh, some elements, but I, don't, I, I think one of the key issue is that uh, when we move into population effects, metapopulations, the real consequences of the same stress or even the same pesticide at the same dose will depend on landscape structure, will depend on environmental uh, conditions, will depend on the ecological conditions. The effect will be different in Finland than in south of Italy, and obviously will be different in, in part of Europe than in, in Brazil or other areas. So my question is, do you feel that we have already sufficient scientific knowledge to address the ecological and, uh, and environmental va variability? And if not, what should be the next steps? Thank you. And the final question from uh, the auditorium is from the gentleman over there. Is it working? No? no? You get another one? Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mauricio from Lincoln University. I would like to ask uh, about uh, the biodiversity and ecosystem services. Can you highlight some ways that we can enhance uh, those processes at farm and landscape level in terms of uh, increasing biodiversity? And the other question I would like to have to uh, Professor uh, Smith, it's about, you show a picture that I think it's uh, about the paper of uh, Seralini about the transgenic into rats. And you say that the, there is a bad data, bad quality data. So I would like to know um, why in that sense is bad quality data based on basically that those authors reply to all those critics that were made by scientific community in another paper in another journal. So, yeah, I would like to know what's the criteria to say that's bad data. Okay, thank you very much. Different types of questions now. I would just like to give anybody who wishes at the podium the possibility to uh, bring in some final reflections. Okay. Because after this round, I will have to close. I'll just bring in a positive aspect following up on what Maureen said about incentives. Um, with public or private lands. We have a, a new initiative in the US um, and we're actually having to pay farmers to put in biodiversity. And I think it's not gonna happen otherwise because the farmer's driven by economics. Corn or soybeans is more important, but they also have a love for the land. So if we can at least incentivize a bit uh, to do these plantings, wildlife plantings, uh, it's, it's a good step. And, and we're doing that. We have a new initiative. I don't know how many millions of acres, but that's a new initiative in the US. Yeah. More, uh, Laureen? Yeah, so th that's payment for ecosystem services. And, and I think in the US, you do manage your landscape. You do have planning laws, I think. And um, you do set aside areas for nature. So maybe differently from Europe, but I think you do manage your landscape. But payment for ecosystem services is, a, is an incentive we can use. And of course, CAP is one way of doing that. So the question was, how can we enhance ecosystem services and biodiversity in farm scale? Well, we can use those incentives to encourage farmers to put in flower strips, for example, or other types of habitats that will enhance certain aspects of biodiversity and certain services. But we need to compensate them for that. There needs to be an incentive to do that. And we currently have the mechanisms to do that. We may not be using them as effectively as we could do, but they are there. So I don't think that is fundamentally an issue. I think we do have a way forward with that. And the final comment I'd like to make it refers to Jose's question about variability. You, you're absolutely right. And you're not going to be surprised if I say something you expect me to say, which is we need to think about scenarios, environmental and ecological scenarios. Do we have the tools? Do we have the knowledge? I think we have some of the knowledge and I think we have some of the tools. And I think this is where modeling and all the mapping GIS work that is going on in Europe can really come in and play a role. We're mapping ecosystem services across Europe. It's what every country has to do. Can we use that to help us f highlight those areas, those combinations of environmental factors, crops, product use, <coughs> ecosystem service delivery, to help frame and inform our risk assessment in a much more intelligent way? Okay. So I think it's the way to go, and I think we have some of the tools to begin to make a start on that journey. We might not get to the end, but we can make a start. Yeah. Thank you. Payment for ecosystem services and the context with the common agricultural policy or other agricultural policies around the world obviously is a topic. I'm very glad that this is brought up here. My own assessment is that the agricultural community at this stage is still a bit hesitant to take up this uh, approach because they 
uh, feel to have existing systems in place and they are not so sure if and how uh, a new system or what can be regarded as a new system will maybe uh, bring in some changes. But this is a topic of another um, uh, discussion most likely. I would like to give the uh, mic to Joe and Jörg because they have been specifically addressed and then see also if Alan and uh, Glenn would uh, like to thank, come in. Thanks finally. Helmut. Um, uh, speaking specifically about the rat study, so I'll say at the outset I'm not going to uh, um, speak as an expert toxicologist because I, I don't do that. There are others here who are perhaps more qualified than myself but when these sorts of studies come out, all, all, all responsible regulators look at them very seriously and, and there was a, a very quick and detailed reaction to those studies, not only in Australia but around the world and in different countries. And I think, I think uh, amongst uh, mainstream science there was a, a, a very clear consensus that the quality of these studies just wasn't up to the standard that you would expect to be able to take regulatory decisions on. So, so things about the controls, the, the actual species of rat that we used, um, uh, the, the design of the experiments. And uh, I, I guess uh, in terms of the detail of, uh, that informed a lot of our thinking on it, um, we were in contact with colleagues in Europe, but uh, also the um, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, which is our food regulator in Australia, um, I think it's still on their website, but they published a very detailed and thorough critique of, the, uh, of those studies, and I think I'd, I'd refer you to that. I know there's been some work in, in Europe recently to, to, it's aimed to, uh, to, to replicate those studies without too much success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Jörg? <coughs> yeah, I was asked about the non-tiled risk assessment for soil. So what I re when I referred to, to the soil organisms, I just referred to the fact that we have relatively, compared to the above ground situation, we have little, little species-based information. And we are now collecting the, the data, non-target effects data for BT maize uh, as part of the European Craze project. And again, there we have a lot of above ground information, less so on a species level for below ground, uh, simply because people don't look below ground, people traditionally don't look into species effects, but into functional effects. So you, you find more data on changes in degradation of plant litter, for example, than abundances of a particular columbola. Uh, having said that, I think, so my advice would be, and I think the pesticide, in the pesticide world, people are doing that. If you have a concern about soil uh, effects, decomposition effects, you would rather look into functions rather than into species. But I still believe that in the type of testing that I explained, we are still addressing the, the, the soil organisms because we could, if we look at the testing scheme a little bit differently, because the, our starting point is we have a Cry1AB protein, which we believe is effective only to Lepidopterans. So we have a whole battery of organisms that we are testing this toxin to uh, or on. So it's a ladybird, it's a lacewing, it's a honeybee, it's an earthworm, it might be the wrong species, it's the compost worm, but never Nevertheless, so we have tested that compound on a number of invertebrates that are not Lepidopterans. And I, if I look at this sum of data, if I see that none of those organisms, including the soil and the Daphnia and whatsoever, is affected by this toxin, I feel comfortable saying that also the species that I don't know in the soil by name should not be affected. Okay, thank you very much. Alan, Glenn, would you like to come in for some final words? Or? Okay. Um, ju just very briefly, briefly please, Lorraine, yeah. we do not have a national land use planning or management program in the United States. Uh, and I, I don't think we, we ever will in, in my lifetime, certainly. Uh, there, there are local land use planning uh, activities, but they're almost always limited to real estate, commercial, and, and industrial developments. Uh, even at a, a local level, uh, the idea of a, a government <coughs> telling a farmer uh, what crops to plant, what, where to uh, put in crops versus uh, woodlots uh, is a, a generally an unacceptable idea. Okay, thank you. Alan. Perhaps I could just pick that up and, and, and end on what I think is a very positive note. I mean, we are remarkably lucky in, in Europe um, in, in that you know, both our understanding and measurement of our environment, um, so many Europeans spend their spare time 
um, looking at birds and, and, and recording plants and so We know a lot about our countryside. And as Lorraine said, we, we're thinking about corridors and linkage and we're miles ahead. And, and the one dismaying thing I've seen in today, this morning, was Lorraine's map of the Brazilian soybeans coming to Europe, how we're exporting a really serious environmental problem. You know, we, we mustn't be smug about what we're doing in Europe. We export our, our risk aversion because we've got too much food, but we're also exporting problems by, enable, by not thinking where the real global challenges are to environmental change. Thank you. This concludes our moderated panel discussion. It does not conclude yet the session, but I would suggest uh, a big applause to our speakers and panelists and also <laughs> and, and, and of course this applause also goes to you as uh, the audience for bringing in such important points and for having such a good debate. Thank you.